Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that was asked? You first, first, first. How would you tell us? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Last time we covered 11 so-called quick facts from ICR, and today we're going to do 10 more. As a reminder, the whole video used music extensively, and I've had to do some pretty heavy editing to get rid of most of it to avoid copyright problems. As a result, the audio is not very good. I hope that's okay. We're starting off with Turkey Coma. Americans take Thanksgiving Day seriously. Family, football, turkey, and of course, nap time. The annual turkey coma can be in part blamed on tryptophan. Eh, it's mostly just that people tend to eat a lot. If you just have a normally proportioned meal with turkey as the protein, you won't be particularly tired. But if you stuff yourself with beef, you'll still fall asleep. But tryptophan can make you tired, and turkey does have a bit more of it than most meats, including beef, salmon, lamb, and perch but also has less than pork, and we're talking a range of 0.25 grams tryptophan per 100 grams meat in pork, 0.24 for turkey and chicken, and 0.23 for beef. There is barely a difference. Imagine drinking two glasses of water, each half a liter. Into one I place 1.2 milliliters of ethanol, and into the other I place 1.1 milliliters of ethanol. That's 24 drops versus 22 drops. Do you really think you could tell the difference between those two and their effect on your physiology? It's kind of like ICR just went with some pop sci reporting and didn't bother to dig into the actual science. An amino acid our bodies use to produce serotonin, which helps to regulate sleep. Tryptophan is an amino acid. It's used to make a lot of things. I mean, sure, the proteins involved, like phenylalanine and hydroxylase, tyrosine transmissase and tyrosine hydroxylase, are chock full of tryptophan, but so are most proteins. Tryptophan only really makes serotonin directly in the brain after having a much higher dose of tryptophan than any other amino acid which isn't what you're getting in turkey. It's why tryptophan pills indeed can help you sleep, but eating turkey in normal amounts just gets you a dose of a lot of amino acids, and so no significant additional drowsy effects can be attributed to tryptophan. This whole thing is basically a myth. I'm only really still here because I want to know how nap time on gluttony day means God. But feeling groggy after chowing down is really more about overeating, since the body has to digest all that extra food. Oh, they knew this the whole time? Great. Thanks for wasting my time, ICR. Other foods contain tryptophan, like milk, chicken, shellfish, eggs, grains, nuts, fruits, vegetables, and even chocolate. Yup. Is this fact just going to be, hey, it's overeating that makes you sleepy, not turkey specifically, so therefore God designed you to have a food nap? Like, is that where we're going? Let me go check. Yup. The rest of this is just a brief and sanitized history of turkey as a source of meat in the old world and the whole first maize harvest story about Thanksgiving. Nothing in it was egregiously wrong, so, um, I have nothing to say. This was a weird one. It just ended with, we have a lot to be grateful for to God. And, okay, I don't plan to contest that. Be as grateful as you feel appropriate to whatever God or gods you believe in. Our second topic of the day, and 45th overall, is extraterrestrial life. Are there aliens out there? Chak, a chauve bête, the question of whether there's life on other planets is a hot topic in sci-fi movies and TV shows, but secular scientists really do believe they'll find life beyond Earth. There are even programs like the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, or SETI, that scan the skies with powerful radio telescopes listening for alien signals. So far, though, scientists haven't found anything, and while some have said they've had alien encounters, no definitive evidence of alien life has turned up yet. <laughs> Secularists like to push this idea of extraterrestrial life because it reduces Earth to being just another planet with conditions that were just right for life to evolve. Okay. I'll drop the whole gag of using an alien language to talk about alien life. ICR here has this reversed. It's because according to the widely accepted Copernican principle, Earth is not an especially privileged point from which to observe the universe. 
This means that, to some extent, Earth is predicted to be as little special as is needed to support observers who could even wonder if other worlds are inhabited. This probably means that Earth isn't terribly special overall, and so other worlds should probably harbor life. Now, maybe Earth is actually far more special than is thought, but it's because of this basic idea that Earth is probably not terribly special, that confidence in the existence of extraterrestrial life is so high. Now, personally, I'm wary of making the Copernican principle into some kind of scientific dogma, and maybe Earth is actually extremely special in terms of life-sustaining ability. I don't know that it is, though. So I am perhaps more middle of the road when it comes to extraterrestrial life. Further, for emotional reasons, I prefer that the great filter that might solve the Fermi paradox be an early filter that humanity has already passed through. This would result in there being little to no intelligent life, or perhaps even little life elsewhere in the universe. I, for one, don't actually expect humans to detect intelligent alien life in the lifetime of any currently living human, if ever. And I wouldn't be surprised if they don't find any signs of life at all, intelligent or not. Now, if this is true, and it intuitively leads you into suspecting that there is some divine agency behind Earth, I can't stop you. But I'll also point out that none of the currently best evidence explanations of how Earth came to be have problems with them that are likely to be so insurmountable that a god of the gaps will be able to fit into them indefinitely. But hey, you do you. But according to scripture, it seems that God specially created Earth to support life. After all, he spent more time working on our planet than all the heavenly bodies combined. Yeah, that's the claim, and it's a claim made by a book written by people on Earth who didn't even know that other worlds existed. So you'll have to forgive me if I don't put much stock in that claim, especially since it's about a god who, according to most Christians, doesn't need to take time to do anything being both omniscient and omnipotent. And while some people may look to hypothetical aliens for advanced knowledge, medical cures, or even the meaning of life, they probably shouldn't, given there's no evidence that any such aliens exist, much less can be communicated with from here on Earth. Belief in extraterrestrial life simply becomes a replacement for belief in God. It sure can, and then you get UFO religions. And hey, if you want to be in a UFO religion, go for it. Just don't be in the kind of things that poison pudding is a good way to go on an away mission to the comet spaceship or that says it's really, really important that you castrate yourself. But the truth isn't out there, hidden with some alien race that's waiting to be discovered. It's in the Bible, and it tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the very root of life itself. Which in no way conflicts with the possibility that there is life on other bodies besides Earth. Further, there was also no reason given to expect that Earth is unique in bearing life, apart from saying it takes up most of the narrative of Genesis 1. I feel like ICR isn't even trying today. Maybe this time they'll be better with our third topic of the day, and 46th overall, Fibonacci numbers. Like math, some find it fascinating while others find it challenging. But throughout history, intelligent scholars puzzled over numbers to discover how they work. One such intellectual was Leonardo of Pisa, also known as Fibonacci. In 1202, Fibonacci published a book called Liber Abbasi. He introduced the sequence of numbers that later became known as the Fibonacci sequence into Western European mathematics. I swear, if this is the third section where they don't make a point, I will... Well, I don't know but I'll be pretty annoyed. In the Fibonacci sequence, the first two numbers are 0 and 1, and each following number is the sum of the previous two numbers. As the sequence climbs, the ratio of two of its higher values nears the golden ratio, or phi. These special numbers often occur in nature, like in the spirals on a sunflower. The same patterns show up in the circular layers of a pine cone or pineapple, and in clusters of conifer needles. So, what does all this mean? It means that philotaxis is a thing that is, the arrangement of leaves, petals, and other structures on a plant. You see, some spirals are good at filling space without significant gaps, and others are less so. Plants have limited resources, and so there is strong selective pressure to not waste resources with inefficient spirals of seeds, petals, or whatever. We know that the growth patterns of plants, like all organisms, are influenced by genetics, and that this is subject to natural selection. So this is just a result of basic evolution, of the kind that creationists generally accept. That these spirals happen to correspond well to some particular number sequence is inevitable. Noting which one that happened to be, as if it's some kind of revelation, is just the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. If you're not familiar with that one, imagine a man who shoots a bullet into the side of a barn, presumably in Texas, and then paints a bullseye around his bullet hole, then goes around bragging of what a great shot he is. Now you get why this point is meaningless. Well, evolution can't explain the development of mathematical laws. Nor does it seek to. No scientific theory does. Math is invented by humans to help them get on in the world. 
Most of the time, they try to find math that will help them explain the consistent rules of the universe, but sometimes they just play games with math for fun. But the Bible can. Scripture solves this mystery by pointing us to the truth of the intelligent creator. God created all things, both visible and invisible, like math. Except that historically, humans created math. Also, I'm not really sure that that's what the verse is talking about. I think a more plain reading for invisible is things like spiritual powers of the world. So next time you have a math problem, remember the sunflower and praise God for all he has created. How will remembering that sunflowers have space-filling spiral patterns for their flowers help you with math? I can't imagine how. But hey, that brings us to our 47th topic overall, which is our fourth of the day, throwing a strike. Summertime in the U.S. can mean a few things. Grilling outdoors, road trips, and of course, baseball. Great pitchers make throwing a ball look easy, but there's a lot more to it than you might think. It all starts in the premotor cortex of the brain, where thousands of plans are stored. Plans that coordinate whole groups of muscles. Those plans go to the motor cortex. They also go to the cerebellum, which is like a gatekeeper that sorts out data from the tendons, muscles, eyes, ears, and skin. These three parts of the brain, the premotor cortex, motor cortex, and cerebellum, work together. Okay, is this just another cool thing there for God with no argument? Yep, I checked. That's exactly what it is. ICR, please understand that look at the trees isn't a good argument. Even if instead of trees, it's, look at the baseball players. Okay, well, on to our fifth topic of the day, and 48th overall, biblical giants. I'm hoping this has some pseudo-archaeology or something. David, a boy with just a shepherd's sling and a rock, fought against Goliath. A giant man armed with a sword. Or did he? Because 2 Samuel 21.19, probably the earliest source we have for this, says it was Elhanan, son of Jare Regim. But then later, in 1 Chronicles 25, it says Elhanan Sulachmi, the brother of Goliath. Hmm, it looks like we have one of those contradictions in the Bible that aren't supposed to exist. Man, it looks like literalists will have to prioritize some parts of the Bible while all but ignoring other parts by explaining them away with strained harmonizations. Talk about a lopsided battle. David, of course, won the fight. Or was it Elhanan? As a guy who has a history degree, I'm inclined to go with the earlier source, assuming this event is real. And really, the idea that some guy killed a champion of an opposing nation isn't so far-fetched. So I have no problem thinking that there is probably a real event at the core of the Goliath story. But just how big were the giants? Scripture says that Goliath was six cubits and a span tall. A cubit usually means a length of about 18 inches, and a span is about 9 inches. That means Goliath and the other giants were around 9 or 10 feet tall. A human that tall wouldn't be a legendary warrior. Humans can't really get much past 7.5 feet without severe joint, spine, and heart problems. Robert Wadlow, the tallest verified human known to have existed, was 8 feet 11 inches tall and died at the age of 22 from complications from his gigantism. André René Roussimov, perhaps better known as André the Giant, also had gigantism and was 7 feet 4 inches tall. He died at 46 as a result of congestive heart failure, again a complication of his gigantism. And during the filming of The Princess Bride, he had such bad back problems from being so tall that he had to carry a lightweight dummy instead of Robin Wright for any wide shots and the actress had to be put in a harness so he did not have to bear her weight for close-up shots for scenes in which he was carrying her. He only managed to have a professional wrestling career because, get this, pro wrestling isn't any more real than a Hollywood movie. If Goliath had been over 9 feet tall, he would have been bedridden and probably died before hitting 20 of congestive heart failure. You can't just isometrically scale up humans and make them any arbitrary size, and this isn't just true for humans. Ligers are a cross between a male lion and a female tiger, and grow to be considerably larger than either, but also have problems with their joints and generally develop arthritis at a young age. Any animal's proportions are adapted for a particular body size, and varying that greatly will result in health problems, especially if it's varied up. That's as tall as a regulation-sized basketball goal. Kind of makes football linebackers seem puny, huh? Yeah, and Galactus is bigger than all of Earth put together. Just saying something is big without showing that, you know, it exists as described isn't impressive. And it's possible that Goliath, a champion warrior, was even larger than other giants. Well, given that it's not possible that he was as big as them in the first place, since their height is already impossible, no, that's not possible. 
Adult humans today may range from 4 feet to over 6 feet tall, and there are genuine records of non-diseased humans that stand over 8 to 9 feet tall. No, there aren't. Gigantism is a disease, and that's the only way you get that tall, and it has verified and severe health problems associated with it. ICR is just straight up lying here. Considering the wide range of human heights, it's reasonable to say that biblical giants like Goliath were so large simply because of normal human variability. Nope, they're medically and physically impossible. Just go ask Robert Ludlow. Oh wait, you can't because he f died of gigantism at the age of 22, you f waffle pieces of sh**. But no matter how tall or short someone is, the Bible says that God cares for all people so much that he came to offer salvation to everyone. I guess that just didn't include a functioning heart for either Robert Ludlow or Andre the Giant. That kind of sucks. He didn't come as a giant, and he probably wasn't four feet tall either. Most likely, he looked like the average person of that time. In fact, he probably looked a lot like you and me. Well, I can tell you one thing. Being from Nazareth, he certainly didn't look like that pasty-faced blue-eyed guy you got dressed up in a bathrobe with a blue sash. You know, you could just go look at people in the Levant to see what they look like. And it sure as shit isn't that. And normally, I don't mind art depicting religious figures as members of the local populace, but if you're going to show a picture of someone pretending to be Jesus while talking about his probable real-life appearance, you should get someone who at least looks like they could be from the part of the world that he was born in, grew up in, and died in. Okay, our sixth topic and 49th overall is Muscle Man. Bodybuilders are known for having the best muscles, and they accomplish this by perfecting their exercise and diet. It's no easy feat, because the structure of our muscles is complicated, and the biological processes are sophisticated in both man and animals. Jesus Christ, is this just another look at the trees? Let's check. Yep, it is. But this time, they also called bats cool and talked about how they can track prey with their ears showing a fruit bat on screen that doesn't do that. Oh well, our seventh topic of the day and 50th overall is intelligent surveys. You would think after 200 years, the theory of evolution would have convinced more people. Well, the people who matter are the scientists, and it has convinced essentially all of the relevant scientists. The descent from Darwin got some 700 people to sign it. And of course, many later said that they were bamboozled and requested their names be taken off, only for this to not happen. And despite that, the list includes many people with no relevant training to assess evolutionary theory. And that is just 0.23% of the world's scientists. Now, how about Project Steve, which requires one to sign a statement of support for evolutionary theory, and also requires one's name to be etymologically derived from Stephanos, or crown in Greek? Oh wait, that list has 1,489 signatories. And Steve's make up about 1% of working scientists. So essentially, the list has 148,900 scientists. Okay, let's do some math on this. We divide 7,000 by 148,900, then multiply 100 to get a percentage. And oh, look at that. 0.470% of scientists reject evolutionary biology. That means that more than 99.5% of the scientists accept evolutionary theory. So for every scientist who rejects evolutionary biology, there are more than 200 who do not. 11% of Americans believe in Bigfoot, so creationism is far less plausible to most scientists than Bigfoot is to most Americans. But the fact is that still only about 40% of Americans believe in Darwin's popular notion. That's what the leading pollsters like Gallup tell us time after time. The majority of Americans still believe that God created life pretty much like we see it today. Yeah, the fact that Americans are so much at odds with science is a condemnation of Americans, not a vindication of ICR's pseudoscience. Further, as of 2015, Pew found that 65% of American adults agree with the statement, humans and other living things have evolved over time. So it's not even that much of a condemnation. Now that number should be much closer to the number we see in scientists, but ICR can no longer play the we're the majority card. With awesome displays of diversity and definite lines of biological distinctions between man and animal. It's funny how all the alleged things that make humans different from animals are just things that other animals do, but that humans do more, whether it be verbal communication, morality, complex social hierarchy, cooperation, theory of mind, or tool use. Other animals do those things too. God engineered form, function, and fitness within every creature on Earth that allowed life to multiply and fill the Earth. A claim asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. After the terrible destruction of life in the Great Flood, the animals that Noah rescued on the ark once again began to multiply and fill the earth. 
except, you know, virtually all of them apparently went extinct almost immediately, leaving behind no physical evidence of their existence anywhere in the archaeological record. Taken seriously as literal history makes God suck at punishment, suck at salvation, and also suck at optics. I'd go so far as to say that if you're a theist, thinking the Noah's Flood story really happened as described in the Bible should be blasphemy. And mankind, unique in the entire world, continues to excel in creativity, inventiveness, and intelligence. Yeah, but blue whales excel at size, and chimpanzees at short-term memory, and the platypus at having heel venom. Every species is exceptional. That humans are also exceptional is, ironically, not very exceptional. Despite Darwin's devoted followers, Americans are still intelligent enough to recognize that ancient biological slime did not create all the wonders of creation in our world today. Well, that's a really well-poisony way to put it, but sadly for ICR, and happily for scientific literacy, that acceptance of evolution is actually up to 65% as of 2015 for U.S. adults. And since the trend is upward, it's probably higher by now. Creationism is going extinct, and I for one couldn't be happier. Well, we're finally on to our antepenultimate eighth of the day and 51st overall topic, back trouble. Ever have back troubles? We get back pain from all sorts of things, like posture or old sports injuries. But evolutionists would have you think that the root of back pain comes from evolutionary ancestors who walked on all fours. No, it's not that it's the proximate cause of all back pain. It's that humans are abnormally prone to back pain compared to other animals. And this back pain often results from the fact that the spine is vertical and each vertebra must support the weight of essentially all of the body above it. This is not how spines on any other animals work. And it's pretty conclusive that this leads to the propensity for back pain in humans. And that this is certainly not an optimal design given that bipeds like ostriches exist, which manage to not have such horrible back problems. Apparently, our spines aren't evolved enough. Nah, it's more that they're too evolved. The basal condition for mammals is to be quadrupeds, with the spine more or less parallel to the ground. The derived condition in humans is what causes the problem. But the fact of the matter is, two legs or four, we all get back troubles. Yeah, no one ever said otherwise. It's about the propensity for back trouble, which is much higher in humans. Racehorses get back pain from racing, just like humans get aches and pains. Yeah, racing is an unusual thing that horses don't just do on their own. Horses don't tend to get back pain when they're feral wild horses just doing horse stuff. Humans almost all get back pain just from normal human stuff. That's unusual. And pretty much anyone with a backbone can have back problems for just about any reason. Uh, no, there are specific reasons. You're not going to have a back pain just because a spider across the world had to rebuild its web because some big animal walked through it. Only things that actually negatively impact your back, like long-term stress or acute injury, are going to cause back pain. Those things are far more common among humans than among other animals. Not to mention the human spine is designed differently from any other creature's spine. Well, if it was designed, it was designed like an Edsel, and humans should get their money back. But further, that unique spine is precisely the point. It's sh and causes more problems than basically any other spine. When God made humans in his image, he engineered the unique curve in our backs to perfectly hold our heads upright. If the Imago Dei is really the physical makeup of humans, then I have to ask, why God a sweaty monkey? and to effectively transfer our body weight to our hips when we stand, walk, or run on our own two feet. Except it's not perfect. It's incredibly prone to injury over time. So it's likely that back pain didn't come from evolution, but rather the fall of mankind. If your explanation for bad things can explain literally anything about the universe you don't like, your explanation is useless. Explanations are only scientifically useful when they are falsifiable and predict future data. The fall is not and does not. Even if it were true, it would have no place in science. Our penultimate, ninth and 52nd overall topic is Ant Engineer. Having your picnic ruined by an invasion of ants is no fun, and neither is stepping on a fire ant hill. But these little creatures are programmed with amazing attributes that scientists are now learning from. Okay, I feel like this is another look at the trees one. Man, there have been a lot of these today. It's like ICR has run out of things to say. And yeah, I checked. It's just, wow, ants are cool and can solve problems in aggregate. Okay, our final 10th and 53rd overall topic is Land Ho. Let's hope it's not just look at the trees again. Land Ho! Getting ready to book that flight? Uh, nope. Don't have any flights planned as of the writing of this script. 
Despite the no-frills travel these days, millions continue to fly each year. But few travel over 7,000 miles in just 9 days, and no airplane can do it without stopping. That's what a bar-tailed Godwit did in 2007. Oh, for fuck's sake it is, isn't it? Seriously, why even make these videos? It flew 7,145 miles from Alaska to New Zealand in just 9 days, setting the record for the longest non-stop bird migration. The Godwit slimmed down to half its size by the time it landed. Yep, it is. Well, thanks for wasting most of my time, ICR. They also talk about the flood and the birds released by Noah. I don't really care. Well, our next topic for the next time I meet you here is Beetle Battle, which I'm hoping will have some kind of point to it. It will be our 53rd topic overall. If you enjoyed the video, hit like and tell me in the comments what you liked about it. If you didn't, feel free to hit dislike and tell me what the problem was in the comments. Either way, please remember to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you're always notified when I have more content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Hey, before you leave, I just want to take a second to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Bent Hovind, Tapioca Weasel, Denny5252, Eleron Teller, Felkavala, Ian Chen, Kelvin Brostick Van Manen, Landon Knoll, Mabdi Babdi, Monkey They Them, San, Sphincter of Doom, and the Venerable Bead. It's because of my channel members and patrons whom you're seeing on screen that this channel can stay afloat. Without you, it would all shut down. If you want to join the team, there's a link to join the channel below this video, and there's a link to join the Patreon in the description. On the Patreon, you can get a 10% discount for pledging annually, and either way, you get early access to virtually all of my scripted videos, often three to five months before they come out for the general public. Thanks for watching.